Що, що, що? Hi guys, welcome to Snakes and Adders. This is the next episode of our Intermediate Series, episode 28. And today we're going to be looking at this, the King Rat Snake, the Alafe Carinata, aka the Stink Snake, or as I grew up knowing it, the Stinking Goddess, which is just a wicked name. Just about the best name going, really, Stinking Goddess. Pretty fitting too, but we'll get to that. The stink element came like stink element part of the name is in reference to highly developed post anal glands or musk glands, uh, and when the snake is startled, these can release a starting <laughs> startlingly bad odor, uh, and the emissions from these glands are so strong that even hot soap and water may not remove the smell entirely. So pretty potent stuff. Musking is. Um, nothing new though really I mean most snakes will adopt some form of it in uh, their defence uh, behaviours when they're scared or they feel exposed and just a little bit nervous about the situation even corn snakes have been known to do it when they're nervous this guy does seem to have uh, it somewhat specialised though the gland length is up to, quoted as up to being 6 centimetres long and they can forcibly eject the contents which isn't a particularly nice experience and this is a particularly well behaved king rat snake or stinking goddess albeit one that has decided to drop into shed in the time it's taken me to get organized and write the notes about the video but you still look pretty for now don't you you're gorgeous mate aren't you gorgeous the goddess part is in reference to just how gorgeous it is this is a stunningly beautiful snake, which is in, in its normal form when it's not shedding, jet black with yolk yellow patination. And these start off as crossbars and saddles at the top and fade to dots at the rear. Um, it's just, just what, quite possibly one of the most aesthetic of the Asian rat snakes. This snake undergoes an ontogenetic colour change as it grows. And the adult form of this snake is markedly different to the youngsters, which are a straw yellow tan with very, very faded crossbars and what appears to be a striped tail. Other examples of this phenomena can be seen in the Emerald Tree Boa, which is Coralus caninus, and the Green Tree Python, which is Morelia viridis. To a lesser extent, their cousin, the Russian rat snake, also undergoes a similar change. A Russian rat snake like name is Alafishrenki. This is a large and robust snake, heavy set and pl plentifully powerful, serious unit. Um, and adults are impressive. Um, you know, you're really taken aback by just how big they are. Um, this size and on occasion questionable demeanor uh, sees them elevated to the intermediate species territory maximum quoted size for the species is 240 centimeters although there are even exceptions to this uh, i spoke to francis earlier via messenger and he said someone had quoted up to nine feet so you know, really impressive although for the most part the species stays between 180 and say 210 centimeters the king rat snake is so named in vernacular parlance because of its snake eating tendencies in the wild this snake is an opportunist and will take a variety of prey including mice and rats and birds and eggs which it's got some special um appendages on the inside of the vertebrae of the spine to be able to crack those eggs similar to the yellow rat snake which is pantherophis alleganiensis um but it also seems to have a predilection for feeding on reptiles and uh it's you know it's, it, it it has the taste for both snakes lizards and reptile eggs when they're encountered schultz um klaus Dieter schultz lists this species as predominantly terrestrial and very fast for such a heavy built snake they occur in a range of habitats and in truth have been found to be highly adaptable to their local environments and they are known to occur will you stop huffing and puffing and talking you're being noisy see it gaping gently yeah you're telling me off 
ace. They're so ace. Schultz lists this species as predominantly terrestrial and very fast for such a heavy built snake. They occur in a range of habitats and in truth have been found to be highly adapted. I've just read that. Oh, God see. This week is trying me, man. They have been known to occur in forests, scrubland, river valleys and grasslands. They are known to be very fond of mountainsides, rocky escarpments and places of elevation. The biggest variation is in the altitude range that this snake occupies, where they can occur almost at sea level, right up to 2,800 metres above sea level. This obviously makes definitive temperature recommendations a bit of a minefield, depending on the locality that's being worked with. Tight locality uh, for Philophis carinata, the name originally used by Gunther in 1864, is listed as Zhujiang, Jiangxi, China, or Jiangxi Province, China. These pronunciations, by the way, today are going to be off by a million miles, but you're just going to have to roll with it because South Yorkshire lads can barely speak English, never mind try and pronounce Chinese provinces. This species is wide crest, uh, widespread across most of China. The greatest level of cluster, clusters, according to Schultz, occur in central and central northern China in Gangzhou, Ningxia and Sichuan provinces, leading to Inner Mongolia in the north and the eastern Chinese seaboard and lowlands of Jiangsu, Anhui and Zhejiang provinces. Put my teeth in. There is another much rarer subspecies, which is Alafe carinata yono guniensis, which occurs on the island of Taiwan and certain islands that belong to Japan. But we're not discussing this, that snake here. They have an interesting shaped pupil, which you can't really see here. It appears round because the shop is relatively low light, but in very bright conditions, they can develop an almost teardrop shaped eye which is really really interesting um and it, it it's easier sometimes you can see that oval shape there on the youngsters the babies seem to show it off more than the adults it seems to be less i don't know why just less commonly encountered in the adults for whatever reason and they share this pupil adaptation and feature with their cousin from Japan, the Japanese four-lined rat snake, which is Alafe quadriviri gata, which is an incredibly rare snake. Um, but when you meet, I've kept a few of these, and, and when you've held them and met them, and then you look at the pattern of these, you there are parallels. And, you know, um, again, speaking to Francis, he says that quite a few people hypothesize that quadriviri gata uh, Carinata, which is this one, and Davidi, David's uh, rat snake, uh, should all be in like a mini group, as it were. Um, there are a lot of parallels there, and Davidi is also a theophagic, so it eats other snakes. Uh, care in captivity, for the most part, part, is unproblematic. Similar to the king snakes from North and Mesoamerica, another group of the theophagic snakes. In captivity, they adapt perfectly well to eating mice and rats with little fuss. And a bit of variance will also be, you know, quite happily accepted in the form of eggs or, or uh, chicks or even quail on particularly large animals. Babies are stocky uh, and large youngsters will easily accept fuzzy mice as their first meal. And exceptionally large babies may even take small mice from the very start. In truth, though, this species may even feed too well. And there could be problems with obesity long term. So we do need to keep an eye on just how girthy they become. And as already stated, I mean, this isn't a big uh, king rat by any stretch of the imagination. Still a relatively young male. But uh, yeah, he is, he is chunky and he's holding on. And I can feel him. He's pretty dense, to be fair. Yeah, I can see. Yeah. <laughs> Keeps just giving me a look and opening his mouth. You are funny. Yeah, I know. I'm not going to hurt you. I promise. I promise. Okay. Relax, bro. The snake is not quite as robust as this heavy set build implies. They can remain nervous and flighty. 
if cornered or angered, they may inflate their throat and partially gate their mouth. Hi, yeah. Thank you there, bro. Thank you. Um, plus, of course, being able to forcibly eject the contents of the musk gland. Some will calm down and make superb pets, but most will end up like this specimen. Workable, but hardly what we, we would describe as tame. I am not stroking it, fussing it, or giving it any excuse to take flight or kick off. I'm trying to keep it as still as possible uh, for good reason. I don't want covering in musk. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I'm not going to hurt you. Don't, don't get upset. Look, is it my hand that's causing the problem? I can put that down if you prefer. Okay. God, I love this thing. It's amazing. Just look at that pan. Phenomenal, man. Temperament is truly variable. And giving definitives can be difficult. In truth, some are psychotic and will remain that way regardless of the amount of interaction. If you were going to buy one, you'd probably be best trying to source a youngster uh, that you meet and uh, is tractable from the beginning. And we can maybe build up a relationship that way. Um, but this isn't an immediate level snake. If you get bit or you, you have issues, tough. That's why we've put it into the intermediate level. It is what it is. Uh, put your big boy pants on, you know. Um, the enclosure for an adult should be spacious. It's a deceptively active snake and minimum size of probably around six by two by two would be the recommended sort of working minimum. Um, a deep, uh, bottom substrate as this is an avid burrower and they do like to investigate their enclosures. Uh, various hides along the length of the vivarium to make sure this animal feels secure and safe is imperative. And we can also use some branches and foliage. Branches may only be occasionally used. They, some low level climbing possibly, but this is not an avid semi arboreal snake. For the most part, this is a terrestrial animal. Um, particularly nervous specimens will need a fair amount of visual barriers to try and reduce uh, stress and the instinct to flee. They can set off at such a speed that they can damage their rostral scale and nasal area by ramming into apparatus or trying to dive through closed glass doors. Heating should be provided by way of deep heat uh, projectors, which you'll need a couple of, uh, which will warm a basking plate beneath them, or a higher wattage ceramic bulb, always, in both cases, connected to a reliable thermostatic controller, preferably with a day-night function. For the most part, basking temperatures can be anything from 28 to 31 degrees Celsius. As stated, it's hard to give you definitives because they're from such a massive range, both in area and in elevation, which causes some problems. And we don't always know, such as the case with this one, what the original locality of the snake was. A fairly pronounced nighttime drop is perfectly acceptable down to around 18 to 20 degrees Celsius. And there are two ways that we can approach substrates and humidity. We can opt for a relatively dry enclosure overall using things like uh, lignocell or aspen or hemp with a localized damp hide at the warm end uh, of which they can retreat, which will help them shed their skin. Um, or we can opt for a um, orchid bark and core uh, mix, or maybe orchid bark and soil mix, maybe with a little bit of sand in, which we can spray periodically, with spraying ramping up during shedding cycles. But realistically, as with a lot of the larger Asian alafe, respiratory infections are pretty rare, and humidity doesn't seem to be a, a, a huge issue for them only during the shedding cycle so that is where they are slightly dissimilar to the more tropical boas and pythons uh, and again it's just it's a signal of the adaptability of the species in truth um, a period of brumation will be re uh, required to cycle these animals for uh, reproductive trials and some animals from more elevated regions may brumate for up to four months with obviously ramp time either side as well so that could be up to five or even six months total where they're off food or they're trying to seek refuge and hide away conditioned captive animals generally do not need this period to be as long and with a two-month brumation sort of plateau with four weeks either side to cool down or warm up this will suffice 
um, a brumation temperature of around 10 degrees Celsius will be perfectly fine uh, and this will allow the spermatogenesis and eugenesis respectively the male and female to prepare for the coming breeding season. No food should be offered during any temperature manipulation period uh, and females should be heavily fed once back up to full temperature. Males just need a few meals. Heavy set males can be problematic breeders. This is true for a lot of snakes. So you would try and keep your male lean, uh, but keep your female very well fed. Invariably, she will be the bigger snake too. So we don't want her to be hungry when you put a smaller male in the vivarium with her. Bear in mind that there is obviously the elephant in the room. She could eat him and that isn't unheard of. So bear that in mind. Eggs are large and incubation temperature should be a relatively generic 28 degrees Celsius. This will result in hatching in between 50 and 60 days. And as discussed, babies are large and accept fuzzy mice from birth. Large yolk reserves uh, upon birth may result in a protracted period where babies are resistant to feeding. Particularly fussy babies may require something in the form of lizard scenting, whether that be with the cloaca of uh, a gecko or some skin that we've conserved to be able to use it for the purpose. Uh, but for the most part, this won't be necessary and they're generally unproblematic to raise. Babies will uh, change colour um, gradually and this will be complete at around a metre in length, which will take you between a year and 18 months if grown on responsibly. So now we have to move on to, I've got to move, you know, I'm sorry, bro. I know, can we, let's have a close up of your face. Oh, there you go, right up to the camera. Hi. I'll try and turn you around. See this? So it isn't a full on gape and it isn't a, like some of the, the, the collagenathus rat snakes, radiated rats and stuff, they full on. Or uh, Orthriophus, the, the Taiwans, full on gape, massive. This is like sort of a lazy gape, bit of a, a hiss. But if, if provoked badly, then they'll inf inflate. They have this interstitial skin, which is very bright and striking. And this is all there to try and dissuade you from disturbing them any further. So distribution, huge, right from the eastern seaboard of China, right through to almost approaching Antral Pradesh, which is up here in India. It's a, it's a crazy, uh, <laughs> it's just so big. And then when we look at the topographic maps, we've got these mountain regions, these elevated plateaus and steppes when we start getting up into uh, Inner Mongolia. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's just, just crazy how adaptable this snake must be. I'm sorry that the map is dark. I did try to find a lighter version, but I, I couldn't. So the hot spots are drawn in these shapes here with the dotted lines indicating the overall uh, sort of area of uh, distribution and what we then decided to do is we took nine different localities working from uh, Jian all the way through to Wuhan, Hefei or Hefei, uh, Shanghai, uh, Wenzhou, uh, Changdi, Kunming, Chengdu, uh, what was the last one? Now uh, Pingliang which is up here so working round in a clockwise uh, this has given us some interesting data nowhere near as cool as i expected it to be and what we've also done is i've recorded the elevation of each of these regions so in fact let me just slide that so you might be able to see it better i haven't got to move as much then so we have jian wuhan hefei shanghai wenzhou changdi kunming chengdu and pianglang so we're working through, we've managed to, we've got like 5, 9, 15, 21, 27, 32, 33, 30. So your summer peak there. 25, 20, 12, 6. These numbers are quite quite a bit higher than I thought. Um, considering, you know, we've got 405 meter elevation. Then Wuhan, 115. Hefei, 33. Shanghai, 4. Wenzhou, 4. So that's your coastline. Changdi, 35. Kunming, which is in Yunnan. 1,892 meters in elevation, Chengdu 495 meters in elevation, and Pingliang 1,398. Obviously, as you would expect, these are going to be uh, the coolest in the summer months. But amazingly, Kunming actually is quite aberrant. I think there must be some warm air that floats up that region, uh, which the Himalayas help to trap, uh, which is causes the rainfall to drop. But it does seem quite insulated in that regard 
it's nowhere near the coldest in winter but it is approaching it's the second coolest in summer daytime high averages january 7 february 10 march 15 april 20 25 28 30 29 25 21 15 and 10 so for the most part that temperature range actually mimics pretty closely what we would expect of maybe some of the north american pantherophis rat snakes or the the um fox snake pantherophis vulpinus so yeah i mean that they ain't they ain't seriously rough temperatures um Piang, pingliang has the harshest winter of all with january lows of minus 12 and uh december minus 10 so the northern part of the range so pingliang is here right up in the north that's taking a kick in those guys are going to have to be away for whoa, looking at it probably where are we pingliang so maybe upwards of five and a half six months that's a long time to be away without food the averages for nighttime low is 0 2 6 11 15 20 22 22 18 13 7 and 1 and that's represented in this graph here where we can see the action there isn't really a massive divergence between day and night they seem to stay relatively evenly spaced it doesn't diverge in any way really um and january we've got the average low of zero december approaching the same and we're going to be looking at daytime highs not reaching 10 degrees until mid-february and then december so on average about a three month brumation would be required 10 degrees is sort of that 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 cut off where we say yeah for the most part they ain't going to be active and running around rainfall hugely variable probably can't read a huge amount into it but the wet season is is the middle of the year which is june july august and then trails off uh rapidly so we could potentially post brumation after we bring them out say uh april may we can start beginning to maybe ramp up spray and raise humidity this will in um also coincide with breeding activity and then we'd start to get the eggs maybe june and then we can have them coming through july august hatch out they've got a few months to feed uh, in the wild some of the northern animals the same as we discussed with other rat snakes may well have to brumate prior to taking food on board but for the most part in captivity the sort of generic king rats that are out there they they start feeding and they're not overly problematic um definitely do your research this is a halo rat snake for a lot of people they absolutely adore them they're super cool i think we should know them as stinking goddesses though just because i think that's a far cooler name it's a, i'm pissed that it's gone into shed but it's just one of those things um i wanted to I, it's, it's liable to get sold incredibly quickly i'm not gonna hurt you i promise i promise it's liable to get sold incredibly quickly and the truth is that we needed to get this video done because more than likely it will disappear before i would have had chance to make the notes and get the video done didn't want to miss the opportunity so do your research latin name is a lafe carinata you could do far worse as an experienced keeper than try and keep one of these ace snakes who you have really really behaved don't you you have behaved brilliantly and you're absolutely bloody gorgeous look at those yellow dots they're normally bright bl jet black background bright yellow dots absolute stunner aren't you and we've had no musk either so i consider that a particular success because uh i thought after 15 minutes of talking to you this one would have uh, run out of patience but we've done okay we've not done bad so we'll see you again soon Make sure you stay safe with the craziness that's going on with the coronavirus. We will get through it. Just use your head and be sensible. We love you guys. We'll see you soon. Cheers.